We're going to start the North America program a little bit early. We're going to start with Jamula's Kirtan, which I think many people love. And um, uh, this group of youth starting from age 13, um, really talented, personally trained by Vaisheshika Prabhu. These kids are multi-talented. They play many instruments. They play the flute and the drums and classical Indian instruments. Uh, Some of them have been playing since three years old. Um, they performed at many, many uh, uh, global virtual events. They've been on stage at Sadhu Sangha. I've seen them there at Street Harinams in San Francisco, in California. Um, and they go to seniors' homes where they charm people. So um, they play at weddings as well. So, and, they are, and then on the top of all of that, they are top academics. 10 out of 10 SATs, they're great students and studies and ISV and the world and all the rest of us who see you all from afar all the time are very grateful to have you and to be sharing um, your, and hearing your, your, your kirtan. Thank you so much. Away you go. Hare Krishna. Hare you both. Hare Krishna.
If you all weren't bobbing your head or swaying along or even dancing at home, um, you probably had your, your uh, video on mute <laughs> because that was an incredible kirtan and we'll have a chance to hear from the Jamilis kirtan uh, later on uh, for North America. Um, but before we get started, we have been um, hearing a lot about him throughout our travels throughout all these countries as an inspiration for many of the programs that have been happening throughout. So we're very delighted to reintroduce and have uh, and welcome as well, Vaisheshika Prabhu. Oh, thank you. <laughs> and if Good I, to be back. Yes, and if I may, just to um, reintroduce you in, in some ways, even though I think many people recognize your smiling face, um, but Vaisheshi Prabhu is the Director of Marketing, Communications and Innovation for the Bhaktivedanta Book Trust, or the BBT, and he is also a member of the GBC body. Um, we've been talking a lot about goals this year, and Vaisheshi Prabhu is uh, the king of setting very strong goals, and this past year we had the Badra Purnima campaign where we had um, 24,000 sets of Srimad Bhagavatam uh, shake the entire world, <laughs> being distributed and shared with everybody. And uh, today we're also going to hear from Vaisheshika Prabhu about our 2 million goal and how things have been progressing. So please, Vaisheshika Prabhu, take it away. Thank you very much. And I've been watching the broadcast all the way through. I missed a, a, a short section. It's been amazing. And the, the way that you've been hosting, both of you, and I, I saw Deva Madhava Prabhu earlier, has, has just been mesmerizing. Thank you so much. And thanks to everyone for joining. I offer my respectful obeisances to my spiritual master, Srila Prabhupada, who brought the Bhagavad Gita as it is to the world. And what is it? The Bhagavad Gita is a conversation. Someone might say, so what? Well, birds have conversations. Crows have many different... Uh, vocabulary words that they use to express themselves back and forth. Ants communicate and they have conversations, but that these conversations are not very consequential. They're about how do I find food and how do I build a little be better shelter? When we can find conversations amongst the most qualified of people, we tune into something that is perhaps life-changing. But in the case of the Bhagavad Gita, what we're privy to now is a conversation between the Supreme Personality of Godhead, the Supreme Person who is infallible, and his best devotee, uh, the perfect teacher and the perfect student. And what is the result of listening in on such a conversation? What is the value? Well, according to the tradition of bhakti yoga, the value of listening to such, such a conversation called Krishna Katha, or the, this speech about the Supreme, is that you can change your life. And interestingly, the Bhagavad Gita means the song of God. The very fact that it's called Gita or a song is interesting in that the song that we keep in our hearts will determine the quality of our life. And those who hear this song will find uh, great benefits. This is its value. When you hear the song or the conversation between Krishna and Arjun, here's what you get. You become fearless of death. This is impossible. Psychologists have study the reactions people have to death throughout their lives, and no one can escape the fear of death, except for those who hear this song. There's another kind of empowerment one gets, and that is the empowerment of being able to show respect to all living entities. This is also an impossibility in this world. We find that people have some respect for a certain class of people, those that are closest to them, my people, my party, my family, my nation, but not others. What to speak of, okay, it's my species, but not other species. But one who hears this song develops respect, true respect, abiding respect for every living being. And what about forgiveness? 
that's also impossible practically. People try, they struggle for it. It's hard to let go of grudges in this world and be forgiving. But by hearing this song called Bhagavad Gita, the conversation between the Supreme Person and the Supreme Student, one develops the power of forgiveness. This is a worthwhile cause. In fact, it is the greatest cause, and that is disseminating knowledge that not only destroys ignorance, but also gives us the qualities I just mentioned. And what would the world be like if we were able to have respect for one another very deeply, to have the power of forgiveness, and also to be unafraid in the face of death? The Bhagavad Gita is the most important book for the world today because it is unifying and it addresses the core issues that are important to every human being, what to speak of all living entities. Thank you everyone for participating in this and helping to spread the Bhagavad Gita all over the world. There are many good causes, hundreds and millions of good causes, but there's one great cause and that is giving people real knowledge. So thank you everyone who's participating here in North America now that we're kicking off this segment and I hand it back over to our very capable hosts to introduce the next speakers and presenters. Thank you, Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna, thank you so very, very much Vaisheshika Das for, for being the inspiration for so many of us. At one point in time, I think I read um, uh, our, our, our family business and I was like, I'm not a book distributor. <laughs> <laughs> and so laugh at me, you can laugh at me. Everyone can laugh at me. <laughs> no, we're, we're actually cheering you because uh, you've become the leader of that book distribution movement in New York City, the microcosm of the whole world. Thank you. Well, all, all, we, we will do more and more and more with, with your, your, your blessings and Krishna's grace. Um, so uh, we will continue moving on. Um, and we, the, we, let's see who we have next. Hello and Namaskar. My name is Dr. Krishna Abhishek Kosh and I am an assistant professor of Hinduism and World Religions at Grand Valley State University, Michigan, USA. I first came across the Bhagavad Gita through my grandfather, uh, who gave it to me when I was about 10 years old. And the method of learning that he introduced was ask me the toughest questions possible and give me the book to read to figure out what the answers would be. And by and by, I realized that these particular book among the thousands that I ended up reading over a course of a lifetime was meant for giving solutions to everyday problems that we don't get elsewhere. I highly recommend the book and especially on this auspicious occasion uh, on December 25th, 2020, which happens to be Gita Jayanti. I welcome you to turn the pages of this particular source of wisdom and see how it can positively impact your life. Thank you very much. My name is Gopal Gupta. I'm an associate professor at the University of Evansville in Evansville, Indiana. I teach courses in living world religions, Eastern philosophies and science and religion. I'm also the editor for the Journal of Hindu Christian Studies. My name is Dr. Ravi M. Gupta, and I'm a professor at Utah State University in Logan, Utah. I did my PhD at Oxford University in England, uh, where I worked on the writings of Srila Jiva Goswami, Chaitanya Vaishnava Vedanta. Uh, since then, I've been teaching for the past 15 years in the United States at various universities, and the past seven years at uh, Utah State University in Logan. Uh, where I teach various courses on world religions, Hinduism, Sanskrit, as well as theory and method in religious studies. Uh, I've authored or edited four different books uh, um, on various aspects of Hinduism. Most recently, my last two books were co-authored with Dr. Kenneth Valpe on the Bhagavata Purana, 
which is one of the great classics of Indian sacred literature in the Sanskrit language. Welcome, welcome doctors to our panel. Welcome, welcome, welcome. We're beginning to see you all one by one. <laughs> we're very blessed to be in the presence of such dignified scholars. So we're, we welcome you all. Welcome. My name is Brajarani Dasi and my co-host here is Rukmini Dasi. And so we just want to welcome you to this beautiful day of talking about the Gita. And the, the Gita is applicable to all walks of life. And so we're gonna start with the area of education where you three illustrious souls are sharing um, the Gita in the world. So I'm gonna start with a question for you, uh, Dr. Ravi Gupta, otherwise uh, Radhika Raman Prabhu, who I listen to often and am so amazed by. Um, so why is the Bhagavad Gita a classic of world literature? Yeah, first of all, thank you so much for having me here. I'm delighted to participate in this really professional production for World Gita Day. Um, and of course, I relish any opportunity to speak about the Bhagavad Gita, which I've been studying since I was a child. Um, why is the Gita classic of world literature? I think that's a wonderful question. Um, there is a, a professor of religion at the University of Chicago by the name of David Tracy. And uh, he, uh, in one of his books, writes about what he thinks makes something a classic of literature. And he points out a couple of different um, uh, uh, characteristics for what we might consider a classic. Uh, one of these is the fact that he says a classic is something that is um, uh, it always has an excess of meaning. In other words, it's always overflowing with meaning. So most books, if you read them, if you read them once, you read them twice, you more or less get everything you need to from that book and then you can put it away on your shelf and you might consult it because you forgot something. But there are some books, a few books in the world that when you read them, each time you read them, it produces something new and fresh. And no matter how many people read them and over how much time, there is always more meaning to be received from it. Like a well that is always full of water, like a mine that is never empty of gold. Um, so uh, that's one characteristic he gives, uh, which is a book that always has an overflow of meaning. The other thing he says is that um, a um, a classic is a book that stands the test of time. So uh, it is something that speaks not to just people in the 19th century or not just for a few decades in our own century, but something that speaks to people across vast periods of time. And finally, he says, a classic is something that speaks across different cultures and civilizations. So we can all think of books that speak to us because, you know, it's about um, an, a culture and environment that we grew up in and it speaks to our type of person. But again, a classic is something that can cross those boundaries. It's specific in its meaning, he says, but universal in its relevance. Uh, I'll say that once more because I think it's really important. He says a text is... A classic is something that's specific in its meaning, but universal in its application, in its relevance. In other words, um, a classic is not a work that is generic, um, that doesn't really say much because it says everything type of thing. No, it has a very specific message, but that message touches the hearts of people across cultures and languages. And when I read that description by Professor Tracy, I couldn't help but think of the Bhagavad Gita. I mean, among the, the books of world classical literature, there are maybe two or three that have been translated as frequently as the Bhagavad Gita and read as widely, um, studied by philosophers and artists and poets and scientists and thinkers of all different varieties. 
uh, the Gita is a really special book. Um, it's, it's always got this overflow of meaning. I mean, if you think, if you think through the, the many different varieties of interpretations that you find of the Bhagavad Gita, and there's always more to be said about it. There's always another explanation to give and another source. Of, it inspired persons like Gandhi, uh, Mahatma Gandhi. It inspired scientists like Robert Oppenheimer, um, who, who was the lead scientist for the Manhattan Project. It inspires um, poets and philosophers across the spectrum. Uh, but at the same time, it's got such a specific meaning. As Vaisheshika Prabhu was saying, it's a conversation between two persons. You can follow the conversation. You can see what's going on. Um, what, what are the various moods being expressed and the feelings? Um, and so it's specific in its meaning. And yet it has the ability to, to touch people across different cultures and civilizations. So it, it's really um, a, a paradigmatic case of a, a, a classic of literature. It's an exemplary example of what a classic should look like. Well, thank you so very, very much for that. I will not forget this overflow of meaning, the way you describe that, this like coming back to it over and over and over again. And each time something new is coming up out of that, like I can, I can eat that. So thank you so much for that. <laughs> no, I, I, I can certainly say, and, 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 and then I'll let you go, but it's it's something that I've experienced in my own life. Where if if you read the if you read the perhaps you've experienced this too, but you pick up a copy of the Gita and you've read that verse before, maybe a dozen times, maybe a hundred times, and yet you read it again and it says something different to you this time. <clears throat> it says something that is relevant to you right now in this moment, and there are very few books that can pull that out. Thank, Thank you. you. I think a lot of people uh, will relate to that point that you just, it was one of the points that I wanted to reflect as well after you spoke, um, because a lot of our presenters um, in our previous countries as well mentioned the same thing, that it's a book that I can open up to any page and I can relate to it. So thank you for that. Mm. We're going to move over to uh, Dr. Gopal Gupta. And as you might've noticed, they both have the same last name. Usually that doesn't mean that they're brothers, but in this case, it does mean that they're brothers. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to head on over to Dr. Gopal Gupta, also known as Gopal Hari Prabhu. And I've had the good fortune of hearing him lead fantastic kirtan. So I'm remembering that right now at this moment. Prabhu, we'd like to ask um, you a question based on how can the message of the Gita spread universal peace and love around the world? Thank you. It's uh, again, uh, very nice to be here and uh, participate in this very momentous occasion. Um, so how can the Gita spread universal peace and love? It can certainly spread universal peace and love because this is actually what the Gita is about. I think most of you know about Mahatma Gandhi. Mahatma Gandhi, uh, his nonviolence movement is credited uh, for bringing independence to India. He was the inspiration behind many social reformers like Mar Martin Luther King. And he said that he found his principles of nonviolence in the Bhagavad Gita. Now, to the casual reader, this may appear rather odd because in the Gita, Krishna encourages Arjuna to fight. But if we look at the Gita more closely, we see that the Gita is teaching nonviolence. But Krishna's philosophy of nonviolence is not a sentimental philosophy, it's a very practical philosophy. Krishna has two themes that he repeats over and over again. One is detached action, which is karma yoga or nishkam karma yoga. Another theme that he talks about the most is devotional action, which is bhakti yoga or the yoga of love. So Krishna is telling Arjuna that one should act, but one should not act for oneself. One should act, but one should not act out of revenge or selfish desire, or anger, or lamentation, or ignorance. Rather, one should act only for virtue. One should act for dharma. One should act for the benefit of others. And one should act against evil. Ultimately, one should act out of love 
for others and for God. So Krishna is, um, is not teaching a philosophy of inaction, but rather if in a philosophy of action, but one that is not for oneself, but is for fundamentally for others. The context of the Gita, the Mahabharata, greatly helps in, in, in understanding Krishna's position. As many of us know, Duryodhana, who's the head of the other side, he regularly kills men and he rapes women. He's not a friendly person. And he, uh, you know, is, is, is very, uh, very cruel towards, towards uh, whoever he meets. And uh, Krishna's argument in the Gita to Arjuna is that Arjuna must act. His inaction, not his action, will be evil. His inaction, not his action, will be evil. It's a duty of a warrior to protect the weak from the strong when all good argument fails. So Arjuna must protect his citizens. He must protect goodness in this world. And to illustrate this point, we might reflect back at, a, you know, at World War II and the Holocaust. Um, there's a very good book by Simon Weisenthal. He's a Jewish survivor. He wrote this book called The Sunflower. And in that book, he reflects on what happened. And I quote from his book, he says, I asked myself if it was only the Nazis who had persecuted us. Was it not just as wicked for people to look on quietly and without protest as human, at human beings enduring such shocking humiliation? So Simon Weisenthal, he believed that not only were the Nazis violent, but also those who did not protest, the countries who stood by silently without protecting or helping them, they were also being violent. So this is a similar situation. Duryodhana is very much like a Hitler. Duryodhana and his party are very much, uh, they've, they've tried to burn the Pandavas alive. They've done so many uh, you know, horrible things to them. So as a, now it is Arjuna's duty to protect. And Krishna is saying that do your duty, but do your duty without any selfish motive, motive. Do it out of love for others and do it while realizing their equality and common spiritual identity. And it's at this point, it's on this platform that we can attain peace and brotherhood. So the Bhagavad Gita is teaching universal peace and brotherhood on the platform of a common spiritual identity and on the platform of, of uh, you could say, uh, uh, selfless action. Incredible. Thank you so much, Prabhu, for these nuggets of wisdom. <laughs> we'll move on to our next guest, Brajrani. Dr. Krishna Abhishek Ghosh, a question for you, uh, particularly in this day when people are so fatigued by COVID-19 uh, pandemic and lockdown, people are finding they're spending more time with their loved ones, and that's putting a little bit of a strain on relationships. How can the Bhagavad Gita help? Thank you for uh, having me here today. Uh, I'm very grateful to see my new friends and get introduced to my new ones. Uh, now, in terms of the topic itself, um, if I may start with a story and end with my main point, that would be kind of, if you allow me to do that, that'd be helpful. Um, you know, when I was when I was wondering about the question that I had to address today, one of the things that crossed my mind was how, as Radhika Raman Prabhu said, a classic speaks to many generations in many ways and gives messages that are relevant to the time, place, and circumstance while being universal. And one of the things that we scholars do is read texts intertextually. That means we just don't read the Bhagavad Gita, but we look at the broader tradition that makes the Bhagavad Gita stand out. And in this regard, I would refer back to a story in the Bhagavad Purana, where Maharaj Parikshit suddenly comes across a person who looks like him, but behaves very differently. He's cut off three legs of a bull, He's beating that bull mercilessly while a cow looks on, right? And most of us know the story. 
And as the Bhagavat will tell us, it's a form of a fable with the point that wherever there is ethics, dharma, there is prosperity on Mother Earth. And when I look at the verse, Yada Yada Hi Dharma Syaglani Bhavati Bharata of the Bhagavad Gita, I realize that what Krishna is saying there is something very, very specific. Wherever there is a decline of dharma and the rise of a dharma, I come and kind of reset things. Right? And in the Bhagavad Purana, dharma is defined very precisely in that section as Satya, Socha, Tapa and Daya, which one of the very prominent commentators of the Bhagavad Gita, Srila Prabhupada, uh, terms in his colonial English as the four regulative principles, or really the four pillars of Dharma. Wherever there is a rasa, or like a kind of, kind of um, meltdown of Dharma, and a Dharma rises, especially at that point of time, Bhagavad Gita and the speaker of the Bhagavad Gita and the agents of that speaker become very relevant. That's why the Bhagavad Gita, in a way, starts with the first, this first syllable of the Gita starts with dha, in a sense, dharma kshetri, guru kshetri. And if you look at the last verse of the Gita, yatra yogeshwara krishna, yatra partha dandurdara, tatra vijaya sri bhutir, dhruvanitir matir ma ma. Right? And some commentators have pointed out, see, the first syllable is a dha, dhar, and the last syllable is a ma. So the whole book is about dharma. Right? Um, that's the first thing. The second thing is when Parikshit Maharaj is looking at the meltdown of dharma, and he is protesting, he's kind of running to the rescue of the bull, the father bull who represents ethical values and mother cow who represents the earth, he's really doing the work of Lord Krishna. And so the Bhagavata is not just about Bhagavan, it's about the devotees who live the principles of the Gita every day. And now when it comes to our situation, and we are all, I wish we could all meet in person because that's what conferences are for. You hang out with the people you like after the conference, right? Um, <clears throat> I wish we could meet in person, but we are going through a global pandemic. And one of the things that nobody or not many people are talking about is how we got here in the first place. Right? And we all know, at least the story right now, is that somebody ate a wild bat in China. <laughs> and then um, the entire planet is grounded, at least for a year, if not more. And the story goes that the virus kind of skipped between species. Right, and now here we are. In my understanding, if you look at the big picture, it's because of a negligence of the principles of dharma we are here today. And if we go around the supermarket, you, you, you go anywhere we want, you know, the first thing you see today is a hand sanitizer, right? There at a very grassroots level is the practice of socha, one of the principles of dharma. Right. So the Bhagavad Gita presents what, you know, people from the Sindhu civilization that we call Hindus today uh, as Sanatana Dharma. And why is it Sanatana? It is because these four ethical values are timeless. They are beyond context. They can be practiced anywhere. And to reflect on Gopal Hariprabhu's point about Krishna speaking the Bhagavad Gita in the middle of a battlefield. Right? I must say that he was doing that to preserve these eternal values, right? And he himself never took up weapons. So at the end of the day, if you look at the Bhagavad Gita, it speaks to us individually, right? We can open up a verse and it'll speak to us about the human struggle that we are going through right now, about the suffering that we all share, right? And the hopes and aspirations that we have for the future. At the same time, the Gita gives us a form of cautious optimism. It tells us that this world is Dukhalayam Asashvatam. No matter what you get is not permanent. 
right? Even Sri Krishna departs for the spiritual world and he leaves behind his words in the forms of the Bhagavad Gita and his deeds in the form of the Bhagavad Purana. And then it is up to us to actually look at his words, at his life, make meaning out of it, but most importantly, practice it. And I ask myself time and again, there are so many translations of the Bhagavad Gita. People just sat at homes and wrote one. Why is the one that is most read around the world traced back to somebody who would give up the comfort of retirement and come all the way to the Western world at an advanced age to do this? When I think about it, when I look at my grandparents and great grandparents, I see this as utter madness. It's utter madness, but, but the Gita speaks to individuals, not only at their level, but when we go deep, it also tells us how we are a part of a collective. Right? And that's where we start looking at the crises that are facing our planet. And we see that the analysis of why we are here and the solution to how we get out of here are also there in that particular book. And that's why it's one of my favorites. And that's why I think that the Gita is best read through the lives of people who practice it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, all three of you. I feel like we should have, you know, one hour sessions or even longer sessions with each one of you. So we apologize, we don't have, you know, more time to spend, but thank you so much for your uh, wisdom and the context that you bring to the Bhagavad Gita. So thank you very much, all three of you. Thank you for having us. We're gonna move right along um, to actually a part that I've been waiting for a while because I heard, I saw the name on our schedule. Um, next, we're gonna be hearing some Kirtan uh, led by Javi Prabhu, who is a disciple of Srila Prabhupada and also is a Grammy Award winning singer as well. Um, if you have heard some of his Kirtans at either at Sadhu Sangha, you know you're in for a treat. So let's go straight away to the Kirtan by Javi Prabhu. <laughs> Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare, Hare. Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama. Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare, Hare Krishna. Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, 
हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे 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 कृष्णा हरे कृष्णा 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 हरे 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 राम Krishna Hare 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 Ram Hare Ram 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 Hare 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 Krishna, Hare Krishna, it's beautiful, 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 beautiful. I always love Javi's kirtan. And so next we're going to go to, oh, goodness, I'm in the wrong spot here. So sorry. Next we're going to go to here, Malini Devi Dasi, um, who is not only a manager at eBay, which is a top country uh, company in the US, mm -hmm. but also a big dis book distributor, Sankirtan leader for ISKCON Silicon Valley. And she's been an inspir inspiring force for Sankirtan for devotees of ISV. So let's hear her. Hare Krishna. You might be wondering why devotees go out on book distribution. One of the main reasons why devotees go out is because the overwhelming happiness they derive um, during their daily spiritual practices, they just want to share with others. Sharing means caring, right? Having said that, let's see what are the prominent places where book distribution takes place. Streets are one of the popular spots for book distribution because you can meet people there. Devotees come up with creative signs, creative ways to attract the attention of people so that they can distribute a book. Harinam Sankirtan is one of the most popular avenues in Street Sankirtan. Kids and adults and parents, everybody enjoy distributing books on Harinam Sankirtan. During the pandemic, social media and phone calling has become one of the most effective ways to distribute books. Door to Door actually was started by Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu 500 years ago when he sent Haridas Thakur and Lord Nityananda to go and knock on every door and teach them the holy names. And just 10 years ago, Sri Krishna Purushottam Prabhu restarted this program at ISV where we distributed thousands of Bhagavatam sets knocking on people's doors. Airports were popular in the 70s and now we are getting attention again at the airports, especially in the Atlanta airport. Thousands of people pass through the airports and travel is stressful and they like the books because that will help them relieve their stress. People working in corporates are looking for books which can teach them simple living and high thinking. Our volunteers are designing courses that can get them started on their spiritual journey. Not only that, when they come for these courses, they are getting a Bhagavad Gita. And they are so eager that they wanted to share these Bhagavad Gitas with others who are in need of this book. Vegan restaurants and Govindas are popular places for prasadam. And they are actually proven to be one of the popular places for distributing Bhagavad Gitas also. There is a devotee in Monterey. She has a cafe. Her name is Jamuna and she is distributing thousands of Bhagavad Gita's to all her customers. Recently, due to pandemic and the wildfires in California, people actually have lost their loved ones and been in a very stressful situation. But Jamuna actually gave a Bhagavad Gita along with the box of the prasadam and people are appreciating these Bhagavad Gita's and it is also helping them heal within. 
Another important avenue for book distribution is prisons. We send books to the prisons and the inmates there find renewed hope and real knowledge by reading these books. One of the inmates actually uh, who was reading the Bhagavad Gita, he started his own classes that he's sharing the knowledge of Bhagavad Gita with other inmates. They are building a community and also finding strength in each other's association, especially during this difficult phase of their life. They cannot afford these books, but our congregation members really want to help them. So they're sponsoring books to be placed in prisons. We also distribute Bhagavad Gita's to frontline workers. This year, California had the worst wildfires in its history. And we wanted to show appreciation to all these firefighters. So we went out to give books as gifts to these firefighters along with Pasadam. Hospitals are intense places. People are really suffering there. Actually, a group of our devotee volunteers went with cases of Bhagavad Gita to place in the hospital chaplains. And when they went there, they took the books to all the rooms of the patients. And when the patients saw these spiritual books, they were in tears. Motels are the most popular places where we place thousands of Bhagavad Gita's next to Bible in the nightstand. People really read books in the motels because they have time. There is one story I would like to share. Um, there was one person who came to a motel and that person actually wanted to commit suicide. So he checked in to the room and then he by chance opened the Bhagavad Gita in the, in the night stand. He read the entire Bhagavad Gita and he changed his mind and he, instead he went, instead of committing suicide, he actually went to the help desk and said that this book actually changed my life. Can I please keep a copy of this book? That was life changing. There are various occasions like baby showers, bridal showers, weddings, funerals, and Bhagavad Gita is the best gift for any occasion. We are also empowering small businesses like grocery stores, um, jewelry stores, then real estate agents and accountants to give Bhagavad Gita as gifts to their customers. And their customers love them. Our congregation members also uh, want to support Srila Prabhupada's disciples who are maintaining their lives just by distributing Srila Prabhupada's books. Devotees are trying their best to give an opportunity for everyone, irrespective of their nationality, their color, their race, their background, so that they could connect to Krishna through Bhagavad Gita. We just live to give. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna, live to give. In addition to the 5,000 books that are being distributed today, there's also 10,000 cookies that are also being distributed. And as she said, there are so many, many ways to distribute books. So whatever you can come up with, there's probably as many ways to distribute books as there are people on this planet. So if you can think it and do it and make it work, then go for it. Absolutely. They're totally admiring the mood of live to give and finding such unique avenues of uh, sharing this wisdom. So. Thank you to Malini Mataji and all the wonderful devotees behind all those projects. Such great avenues. Next, we're actually going to um, hear from some kids. They're a bit older, but they're just as cute, I promise. <laughs> um, and these wonderful teenagers um, all across North America are sharing their favorite verses from the Bhagavad Gita and how they apply the Bhagavad Gita's wisdom to their own lives. So let's check that out. Bhagavad Gita has had such a great impact on my life. It's put enigmatic topics such as life after death and the material existence into a comprehensible form for me to understand being a neophyte. My favorite verse from the Bhagavad Gita has to be Yam Yam Vapi Smaran Bhavam Tejantyante Kalevaram Tam Tame Vaiti Konteya Sadatat Bhava Bhavitaha It tells me that my consciousness at death will determine my future life and to therefore keep my thoughts on Krishna at all times. Hare Krishna, the Bhagavad Gita is a constant reminder to me that Krishna is always by my side and that I never have to face challenges in my life alone. It's a means by which I can connect to Krishna no matter what happens in my life, in any place, at any time, and under any circumstance. 
One of my favorite verses from the Bhagavad Gita is chapter 10, verse 10. Teshram satata yukta nam bhajatam priyati purvakam dadami buddhi yogam tam yena mam upayantite. To those who are constantly devoted to serving me with love, I give the understanding by which they can come to me. The Bhagavad Gita is a fundamental resource in which I refer to to gain a better understanding of life and also to relieve stress. The Bhagavad Gita has brought me great stability in various aspects of my life and also made me a better person. A verse that brings me deep comfort is Sarvasya Chaham Hridisani Vishto Matas Madhargyanam Apohanam Cha Vedesha Sarvar Ahameda Vidya Vida Dukrit Veda Videva Chaham Knowing that the Supreme Person is always seated in my heart brings me great reassurance that I can refer to him at any point in my life. The Bhagavad Gita is a foolproof manual for how to live our life. These words spoken directly by Sri Krishna give us deep insight about who we really are and what our purpose is. One verse that I really loved is In this verse, Krishna reminds us that when we worship him exclusively, he carries what we lack and preserves what we have. In this way, he always supports us. The reason I love the Bhagavad Gita is because it answers the most important question. What is the source of misery? Krishna says in the fifth chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, Yehi samsparsha ja bhoga dukkayonaya evate adhyantavanta kaunteya nate shuramate buddha that the source of all misery is due to contact with the material senses and that such material happiness has a beginning and an end. For this reason, wise people don't gain, don't look for happiness in such material pleasures because they have a beginning and an end, and rather they look for happiness through devotional service. I love the Bhagavad Gita because it has a bunch of practical knowledge that we can all use in our own lives for anyone from ages 1 to 100 and everyone in between. My favorite verse is from chapter 15. It reads, Sri Bhagavan Uvacha and tells us how important it is to read and hear the knowledge of Sri Krishna in the Vedas. I like the Bhagavad Gita because it's God's words to us and He spoke it because He cared about us. Whenever and wherever there is a decline in religious practice, O descendant of Bharata, and a predominant rise of irreligion, at that time I descend myself. I love this book, the Bhagavad Gita. It's truly my guide in life. Whenever I have to make a hard choice, I always refer back to the wisdom in the Gita. My favorite text is from chapter 12, where Krishna says, Yes, vin no dujate loko, loka no dujate chaya, harsha marsha bayod veger, smutto yasa chame priyaha. One who's equipoised in happiness and distress, fear and anxiety, who never brings distress upon anyone and is never distressed by anyone, is very dear to me. And this verse brings me so much peace and stability, and I truly try to live my life by it. Amazing. I can attest to the fact that I was not reading a Bhagavad Gita while I was a teenager or any type of spiritual book. So amazing to, to see all of their wonderful realizations. Particularly at that time of life, you know, teen years for so many are, can be so difficult, but it really sort of made my heart feel great to be able to like, like this is something solid they can hold on to just sort of help them move through those years. So really, really beautiful. So we'll move on. Uh, next we have two gentlemen, um, one Rasnath Prabhu, who has a bachelor's in engineering um, and is an, M an MBA from Cornell. He's been profiled in the Wall Street Journal, New York Times, CNN, hello there, Hare Krishna, PBS, and he coaches numerous leaders um, from very, from numerous, uh, from hedge funds to start tech startups to other kinds of organizations. And his partner, Hari Prasad, um, who graduated from um, film school, very different kind of background, um, and um, was a writer, a director, an actor, a producer um, of short films. And he believes that, that certain 
the, the key is certain fearlessness to truly see ourselves, warts and all, along with a humble eagerness to work on ourselves. This is the, this is the key. So together, they have co-founded something called Upbuild, which is which does workshops and seminars in corporate companies. They share the wealth of knowledge of the Gita. Um, what they've learned and seeing how powerful it is in transforming their own lives um, and deeply desiring for others to experience the immeasurable benefits. So um, Upbuild began as a means to help many souls as possible become their real selves and based upon the teachings of the Bhagavad Gita. So let's dive in. Hello, Hare Krishna to you both. Welcome, welcome, welcome. <laughs> So why don't we just start? You two, either one of you can answer this question, but throw it out there, right? Based on the teachings of the Bhagavad Gita, what is your advice for keeping relationships healthy, given that most people are now working from home um, and learning how to deal with the interactions of sort of family life that are really shifting within these difficult times? Thank you, Sad, please. <laughs> Well, there's much that can be said on this. Um, I think the Bhagavad Gita emphasizes self-control as a, a, a pivotal piece of being able to navigate relationships. And it starts with understanding what's going on in myself, seeing, for example, how the three modes of material nature are acting on me at any given moment. So passion and ignorance are things which bring me down and make me um, impulsive and impatient, uh, upset easily. Um, I can become fearful and, and feel alone and at odds with others. Um, and these modes of material nature, they're everywhere. They're, they're impacting us all the time. Whatever we eat, whatever we listen to, whatever we watch, whatever we read, whoever we speak to, we're mm -hmm. taking in the modes that are operating on them. And, um, you know, the author of a book, for example, is writing with a particular mode that is prominent and it has an effect, it gets transmitted. So becoming aware of the three modes of material nature for me has been the most eye-opening thing. And um, it's incredibly important for me to be able to preserve my consciousness the best that I can by being aware of the modes around me and the modes within me and trying to really gravitate towards the mode of goodness and taking shelter of um, the shuddha sattva or the, the supreme goodness, the pure mode of goodness, which is actually not a material mode. It's, it's spiritual by nature and the Bhagavad Gita and all of the, the scriptures, um, their teachings can align us with that pure goodness that the soul craves and that can shelter us amidst all of the storms around us of passion and ignorance. How succinctly put, you know, that everything, the modes are in everything. And so everything we consume through here, through here, through all of our senses, we're taking in, it's taking it in. Um, we're not just, not just operating on us, we're actually consuming it. Um, and it is, so that's, um, I know I've heard that before, but somehow you put it in a way that just was like, bang, what are you doing with your time? What are you taking in? So thank you. <laughs> thank you so much, Hypersad. And I would like to highlight the point that you mentioned about introspection, how much that plays a huge role in one's life and in trying to imbibe the wisdom from the Bhagavad Gita, how much that is required. So thank you, Hypersad. And maybe Rasanath, I can ask you the question, our next question about how you find the Bhagavad Gita teaches um, how to maintain a balance while you're juggling various responsibilities, whether that be work or home, um, children. <laughs> um, how would you um, help us understand that point? Um, thank you. Um, balance is a very, uh, very easily thrown out word, uh, but something that's um, uh, that takes work to preserve and maintain. The reason for that is balance essentially means that there, there are multiple opposing forces. Many times when we ask uh, about balance, we are hoping that the forces that I don't feel good about are actually taken away from my life. <laughs> um, so what we're trying to do is eliminate tension, uh, but the idea of balance is how do you create a healthy tension between everything? 
And so when you have to create a healthy tension, um, you the 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 learning here, which is actually it takes it takes practice and it takes uh, it takes some diligence, which is why Krishna in the Gita also talks about practice as uh, one of the biggest things. Um, is how do I understand what the opposing forces are, and how do I learn to keep them in balance? And that that takes that takes one. <laughs> Uh, a very clear knowing of what the opposing forces are. Uh, and number two, uh, a lot of advice, good advice um, from people who have walked it uh, to actually teach us how to walk it. And the third thing is really tapping into uh, a very strong, deep spiritual practice. To me, the crux of balance actually lies in uh, being able to tap into uh, what the super soul is actually asking us to do at a particular time. And again, that's not, uh, uh, that's not an easy thing to do. It actually requires us to really take to a very strong spiritual practice to be able to tap into the wisdom of the super soul. Um, so uh, a short answer to your question, very practically, uh, introspection and a fine balancing of opposing forces, lots of guidance from people who do it well, and a very strong spiritual practice so that you can tap into the wisdom of the super soul. Anybody's heard of the term happy tension, but I like the way you brought that up. Um, uh, yeah, thank you so much, both of you. I think these are two questions that a lot of people have um, just in general, and when they come to the Bhagavad Gita for the first time, it is something that, you know, they bring with, within their heart. So you both practically and so eloquently have answered these questions, and we're so grateful for the both of you uh, joining us on today for our World Gita Day. So thank you very, very much. Thank you very much, Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. What a wonderful uh, duo. I know I've, I, I imagine, Brajrani, you're in New York. You've had the opportunity to meet them personally as well. I've had many opportunities to meet them. Um, their wives are very close friends of mine. So uh, it was very nice to see both of them. Um, mm -hmm. Before we head on to our next section, we just want to remind everybody that um, the Live to Give campaign is continuing on after hearing these wonderful dignitaries, the teenagers, Malini Mataji, and now Rasanath and Hari Prasad, wonderful uh, entrepreneurs in their own way. Um, after hearing all of what they have to say for the Bhagavad Gita, if you don't have a copy yourself or would like to give it as a gift to others, um, please look at the links that are provided on either the YouTube channel or on Facebook. Um, they are pinned links and our wonderful broadcast team will make sure that anybody who asks for a copy will get you into contact with one of them. So um, please look out for that. And while you're on our social media, whether it's Instagram, Facebook, or YouTube, please give us a like um, and support the cause that way. And with that, we're going to continue on with some Kirtan again. We started off our program with great Kirtan and we're going to hear again from the Gemulus Kirtan group right now.
हरी 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 बो हरी हरी बो हरी हरी बो हरे कृष्णा ओ माय गुडनेस आई एम dancing and rocking and it's a beautiful thank you so so very much jamulas thank you very very much uh our next segment our vaishnavis from different walks of life we include a temple president a registered nurse a motivational speaker a full time sankirtan warrior book distributor all sharing their realizations from the bhagavad gita and messages to the world So what I love about the Bhagavad Gita uh these days is particularly a framework called the Gita values and this um outlines six of the key teachings of the Gita that become values that I can take into my life and that can guide my everyday life in connection with bhakti and krishna consciousness. So the six Gita values are uh equal vision samadarshana and the principle of choice that we always have uh uh the freedom to choose and love really isn't love without choice the second two values um are ahimsa and the acharya principle uh these help me show up in the world in good ways with non-violence and also the idea of how to live with example and by example third set of the six key to values is humility and affection ways that i can nourish my character So they are equal vision, choice, ahimsa, the chari principle, humility and affection. Hey Krishna, happy Gita Day to you, World Gita Day. I would like to share with all of you some of my realizations from reading Bhagavad Gita. I really like the point about the duties. It really helps me to go through difficult situations in my life and it guides me a lot what to do when I don't know what to do. And also I like Mm, that it helps me to understand true nature of the soul and i feel like if more people knew our unique relationship with the supreme with krishna and that actually we all unique as a souls there will be a much less and the anxiety anger all the different negative qualities what people have what we all have and this why i think that um, this is invaluable literature for the world and should be widely distributed. My name is Kanka Devi Dasi. I have been a registered nurse for 28 years. The knowledge of Bhagavad Gita as it is, translated by his divine grace AC Bhaktivedanta Swami, has inspired me every day of my life. The speaker of Bhagavad Gita is Lord Shri Krishna. He is presenting the distinction between the temporary material body and the spiritual being. He presents the process of transmigration of the soul, which some call reincarnation. He describes the characteristics of the self-realized person and selfless service. Working as a nurse, I have experienced many times death and dying. This knowledge of Bhagavad Gita has given me inner strength, confidence, and the power of positive thinking. One of the reasons why I appreciate the Gita so much in my own life is the fact that the Gita starts off with the protagonist Arjuna being in a state of suffering, and that is a state that all of us can relate to so much. That state of internal confusion, helplessness, and just not knowing what to do. And what we experience through the Gita is the way in which one can actually move through confusion, and that's through dialogue with someone who has walked the path before us, somebody who has that knowledge and that wisdom to truly impart it to us in a way that we can understand. And so the words of the Gita, the words of Krishna that have been spoken over 5000 years ago, are applicable just as much as they were back then as they are now. Such wonderful Vaishnavis and such wonderful words. Um it goes without saying that uh their personal connection to the Bhagavad Gita is shining through uh through their effulgent faces um and their wonderful words there. So thank you to all of them. 
Um, and we're going to move on towards um, some other great uh, you know, personalities within our community in North America. Both Bajorani and I are from North America, so we feel a bit biased. Um, but uh, we're very excited to uh, introduce Akura Nath Prabhu, who is a practicing attorney, um, has a degree in engineering, and on top of all of that, he is a dear disciple of His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada. And he had quite a life uh, transformation after reading Bhagavad Gita. So let's hear from him um, how the Bhagavad Gita has transformed his life. Hello, my name is Adam Bernstein. I'm an attorney. I practice civil litigation and appellate practice. Uh, been doing so for over 30 years. And I started life as a materialist, as a science student. When I was 15, I started university as a, a major in physics and electrical engineering. And I really thought that to understand any ultimate knowledge would be knowledge about the world, the physical world that we can perceive with our senses and understand with our reason. And when I started reading Bhagavad Gita, uh, at first I considered it strange that they have this conception of God speaking as a chariot driver in an ancient battlefield. And I was thinking if God is everywhere and he's in everything and he's um, creator of everything, how can he be just a historic personality on a chariot somewhere as in a human form. But that's explained in Bhagavad Gita, that he's unlimited and that he appears age after age in um, different forms for different purposes. And he can actually interact with every single person who wants a relationship with him. Because he's unlimited, he can have those relationships with unlimited different people. And I found the conception of karma, the laws of karma, outside of just the physical laws, the, the psychic, psych, psyche laws of how we will uh, experience things or uh, happiness and distress based on our current activities and how we can get out of that through yoga uh, to be completely satisfying. And that's become the goal of my life. I've finished college studying other subjects, history, philosophy, economics, and went on through law school. And I'm a family man. I have a uh, lovely wife, two grown granddaughters. But the Bhagavad Gita, I study daily, I recite it daily, and it gives me the greatest satisfaction. Um, it's more important than any literature to me or any entertainment of any kind. Uh, and it's really the, the goal of my life to advance my consciousness um, and become liberated from the cycle of birth and death. Srila Prabhupada told us to read the Gita and read a chapter a day, uh, which Vaisheshika has been spearheading for the rest of us. Um, so we this North America segment, we've been looking at people across many different walks of life and how they use the Gita and how they think about the Gita as they live and in their work, etc. Um, so, which is beautiful. This last one is Radhavalabha Prabhu, who is um, a founder of yoga, the founder of Yogi Plate, Sattvic Cooking, a yoga and wellness coach. Um, and he shares about how the Gita talks about Sattvic lifestyle, which creates an impression on the body, the mind, and the soul. He did a beautiful um, Janmastami cooking class that yeah. I took, and I took it and I cooked that meal. <laughs> Wonderful. So, let's hear from Radhavalabha Prabhu. Mm -hmm. Namaste. Bhagavad Gita recommends sattvic food. Now you may be thinking, why sattvic? Because this food not only nourishes our body, but it also nourishes our mind. In fact, this food will nourish our very soul. That's why Lord Krishna recommends. Please check it out in Bhagavad Gita, 17th chapter, 8th verse. How Krishna explains that this food will give us not only expand our lifespan but also keep us satisfied and happy. What is the use? What is the use of a big lifespan when the mind is not happy? You know, if mind is not happy, even the best food cannot be, you know, nourish us. We cannot eat and digest. So, a lot of connection has been found in the modern age that how mind rules our digestion. So, therefore, this food naturally nourishes our mind because happy, satisfied, very subtle way and gives a great health. And this food is full of variety and fragrances and spices, aroma, herbs, there is no end to it. So please uh, study Bhagavad Gita, find the best thing that it offers, 
among the food also it includes about food that's the good news everybody loves food and we can take full advantage of it so study bhagavad gita stay happy thank you wonderful presentation by um sorry <laughs> last minute rather vallabh prabhu i is on the tip of my tongue and i'm like wait i know other vallabhs too i'm not sure if i'm saying that right <laughs> <laughs> so thank you so much for Radha Vallabh Prabhu for um, that wonderful nugget of knowledge as well as his amazing cooking. Um, we've had the opportunity to have him during our Rath Yatra and oh, such amazing food. <laughs> Um, next, we're going to have a chance to look at um, Gita being spread all around the world. Um, and in this case, and in this presentation, Gita is being used as an acronym for a guide to inner transformation and awakening. So come see how the Bhagavad Gita is transforming lives everywhere. The agonizing pandemic has caused millions of people throughout the world to suffer directly from COVID-19 and millions more of their family and friends to suffer indirectly. To prevent further damage, governments around the world have implemented lockdowns which have resulted in economic problems and severe increases in mental health problems like anxiety, depression, suicide, and drug overdoses. There is not only a serious, potentially fatal disease spreading rapidly and taking lives throughout the world, but there is simultaneously a mental pandemic in the making that urgently needs to be addressed. While our frontline health workers tirelessly fight the visible COVID-19 pandemic, there is also a dire need of compassion and inner strength to fight the less visible mental pandemic. To this end, we need well wishes like you to make this world a better place. One of the proven ways to achieve this goal is to tap into the universal wisdom of the Bhagavad Gita, a sacred poem whose title translates to Song of God. Great thinkers and leaders have always found shelter in the Gita's timeless wisdom. In the words of Gandhi, when doubts haunt me, when disappointments stare me in the face, and I see not one ray of hope on the horizon, I turn to Bhagavad Gita and find a verse to comfort me. The famous philosopher Henry David Thoreau reflects, in the morning I bathe my intellect in the stupendous and cosmogonal philosophy of the Bhagavad Gita in comparison with which our modern world and its literature seem puny and trivial. The Bhagavad Gita systematically presents universal wisdom to transform society both at an individual and a collective level. For example, the Gita offers techniques to transform the human mind positively by cultivating virtues such as maturity, balance, compassion, and gratitude. This inner transformation manifests outwardly into positive interactions with the society around us. In short, the Gita empowers us to transform our minds, our individual lives, and the collective world around us. The profundity of the Gita's wisdom is discussed in academic institutions throughout courses on conflict resolution, leadership, and management principles. The Gita's wisdom is inclusive of everyone, irrespective of nationality, race, age, gender, color, or culture. Our goal is to offer the panacea of the Gita for the welfare of individuals and communities at large, thereby alleviating the invisible mental pandemic. We sincerely urge you to join hands with us in making this world a better place by helping distribute the grace of Gita G-I-T-A, a guide to inner transformation and awakening. Beautiful video. Um, really, I love the way it brought in. Um, <clears throat> while they're speaking, all of these images, <laughs> these images of all these different souls that are touched by coming in contact with the mercy of the devotees. <laughs> No. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And even seeing some of these, uh, these uh, people who are distributing or sharing these uh, beautiful books, you know, this is happening during the pandemic, they're wearing their masks. So this is not, you know, pictures of earlier years, this is happening right now. Mm -hmm. And even then with the pandemic, uh, the ability to have a personal connection, of course, six feet apart, is still happening, um, and still allowing for that connection to happen. So very beautiful.
So we've had this bit with the 24 hours of, well, the little break in between, but a 24 hour um, of going around the world. And we're ending in North America. And this very last segment is a conversation with Vaisheshika Prabhu. So welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you for the inspiration. Thank you for Live to Give campaign and getting us all fired up. Um, Cause we are as weird, we're trying to get us to be as fired up as you are about this <laughs> Prabhupada's books. So. <laughs> so we have a few questions for you. So maybe we can have a discussion. The first one really is about this campaign itself. And where'd you get the inspiration of Live to Give and World Gita Day? In the past, we've called this the Prabhupada Marathon. It feels like it's somehow morphed or maybe I'm, I'm mistaking something. So where'd this come from for you? Well, I like what you were just talking about before I came on uh, about the six feet apart. I think that could be a, a nice title for a memoir for the pandemic, <laughs> six feet apart. And it came from uh, an inspiration to keep devotees in contact with one another for a higher purpose. I think the whole book distribution movement that Srila Prabhupada started, Srila Prabhupada being the founder acharya of the society called uh, the International Society for Krishna Consciousness. And one of the main purposes of that he said was to publish literatures and distribute them because he uh, saw it as a way to transform society. And it's, it's really not something that is unreasonable at all. In fact, historically, great movements like the movement uh, that started the American Revolution <laughs> through which the Constitution was formed was galvanized and really sparked by uh, a book called Common Sense by Thomas Paine, which still today remains as the best-selling book per capita of any other book in the world. And we think of other philosophical ideas like, uh, like uh, evolution and origin of the species was where it came from, a book by Charles Darwin, which I don't know anyone who has a copy anymore, but uh, the, the concept is ubiquitous. And so, you know, a worthy cause working together and the Live to Give campaign really is based on Srila Prabhupada. That was his motto, really. Uh, if you read his books, you find that this mood is his mood coming from his heart. Like, how to do good for others is a sign of an actually an, an advanced human being. Um, he, he designates uh, that as the highest kind of service that you can do. Or, or the best kind of spiritual practice is actually using your hands, your legs, your eyes, your ears, everything for thinking, how can I do good for others? And what is the best thing I can do for them? So it, it grew out of that. Live to Give is, is from Srila Prabhupada's heart. That's his mood and idea. And we're just trying to emulate it. Thank you for that. I, and we wanted to actually ask what the, the meaning behind Live to Give was because we know that you think of things very strategically. <laughs> so even though it just rhymes and it kind of runs off your tongue very smoothly, there's always a meaning behind it. And it's so um, amazing to hear that it's coming from Srila Prabhupada's heart, which uh, probably enlivens all of our devotees even more so. Um, speaking about the Live to Give campaign, how would you say it's going so far? Um, or are there any examples where you're seeing that um, this Live to Give campaign is kind of fostering a new type of cooperation or, um, you know, new enthusiasm towards book distribution? I would say it's going swimmingly. In fact, <laughs> we've, been, we've been astounded by the success of this. Our, our hair is standing on end. It's been so successful. Uh, from the time we conceived it to the very to this very moment, uh, it's been a, a shower of blessings, especially through the mood of cooperation all over the world. At the beginning of the campaign, we put up a, a placard that said, uh, "Never waste a good crisis," mm. and that uh, wartime and times of uh, change or times when heroes are born and we come out with the best of ideas when we're under pressure. Uh, so we've done really, really well. Here, here, let's look at a couple maps that practically 
I think that um, we can share that on the screen. Uh, one of the tenets of this whole book distribution movement is measuring. M by measurement, we're able to improve and grow. And there's much more to be said about goals, but what we have up on the screen now is a, a, a map that we've been displaying. It shows, first of all, that there are 170 plus communities. That means devotional communities, anywhere from, you know, two people, <laughs> two people and a dog to communities that have thousands of people uh, in them who have signed on to the Live to Give campaign very deliberately and, and are part of it. And that's, uh, that spans 35 uh, plus countries. And I say plus is because we're getting more and more every day. When people hear about it, they wanna come in. Our original goal was to distribute at least, and we always put that clause in for uh, legal purposes. So that <laughs> we have the right to increase if we wish. Uh, two million, at least two million Bhagavad Gita's distributed around the world in multiple languages, like we heard today, uh, very brilliantly. I liked how you repeated this point, Brajarani, Devi, uh, that every town and village, which is Lord Chaitanya's mission statement, which is uh, something that we can really use our lives for, requires that we have every language. Yeah, so in all these different languages. So far, pledges are over 2 million. Mm -hmm. And in a few places, they might have, their eyes may have been bigger than their stomach and they, to, they added a few more uh, or an extra zero to what they could actually do. But in most places, it's very reasonable. So we have every confidence that we're not only gonna actually hit the 2 million mark, but we'll probably smash it. <laughs> That's good yeah. news. <laughs> yeah, you know what I like to think of is, uh, it, you know, like maybe a, a stadium or something, and if you look at two million Bhagavad Gita's in cases stacked up, what would that look like? And what is the kind of um, spiritual benefit, or as sometimes I like to say, what kind of damage did we do to, <laughs> to the vitriol and the, you know, complexities of the world by this uh, by this effort. Two million is significant. I mean, the books are out there. And I find that even as we put a goal out there and the goal seems impossible, and I think that's true for the global number, but I think it's also true for each of our, uh, each of our own center numbers. But the number, it's like, you know, with, with the number there, you can power right through it somehow. Yeah, and again, Rajarani, that, that's, that's Prabhupada. Uh, Prabhupada had a, a motto in management. He said, always create a fresh challenge so that the community members will want to rise up and meet it. That was, that's what actually a movement is. Mm. Uh, um, I've, my fear of the plateau, I live in constant fear of the plateau. Am I on it now? I got to get off this plateau. And mm. as a spiritual movement, we should fear the plateau uh, as much as death itself. And we should also fear uh, mediocrity. Uh, it's, it's the, that's also one of my greatest fears. So, uh, you know, the way to do that is to have a higher bar to reach for. And, and here's one of the most important spiritual aspects. Of course, corporations all know this, uh, you know, disciplined individuals, athletes, musicians know you have to have a goal to reach for. But in our case, what happens? You just alluded to it. And that is you set a goal a little higher than you thought that you could, you could achieve. And then you work towards it methodically, continually praying. And then magically things come to you that you didn't think you could do. And that is what puts the move in movement. It's that magic that we see that we're not doing it were the instruments, that's so important. Absolutely. Seeing the map actually just, you know, brings up the idea that as a community of all of ISKCON across uh, the world, um, to have 35 plus countries and over 170 communities to even come together at one point, I mean, sometimes we don't agree on Akadashi, what we can eat on Akadashi or not eat on Akadashi. So how is it bringing all of these communities, all these devotees together and trying to unify in one direction. 
Oh, what a great question. Thanks for asking that. Well, first of all, having the map, we've noticed just showing it, all you have to do is flash it. For anyone who actually cares, when they look at it and they see a, a blank space around where they live, they start getting anxious <laughs> and say, hey, where are we? And this is very uh, natural for humans. I, I've noted this frequently recently that I walk across a basketball court every morning when I go for my early morning walk. And I just notice that everyone's obsessed with throwing a ball in a hole. And it goes, it, it, it's, it's standard for all humans. You show them a net, you show them a ladder, they want to climb it, they want to put the ball in the net, in the hole, whatever it is. So we have to have something to shoot for. Otherwise, as, they, as the old saying goes, you, know, you miss 100% of the targets that you never put up. Mm -hmm. So it, it, is, it is having just the map to look at and this global concept that we're all in this together. Yes, there's sacred individuality. However, it's best served by working together. And then the sacred individuality as an engine, that kind of impetus people feel to shine individually when it contributes to the whole it becomes extremely powerful and you have this of course philosophical concept a chinta beta beta tafa simultaneously one and different uh, i find that it's more important to emphasize the unity and cooperation let me read you a quote from Prabhupada. this this was his mood he writes we are persons and Krishna is a person and our relationship with Krishna is always open as a voluntary agreement. That voluntary attitude, yes, Krishna, I shall gladly cooperate, whatever you say. That, that ready willingness to obey is only possible if there is love. Forcing will not make me agree, but if there is love, oh, I shall gladly do it. That is bhakti, that is Krishna consciousness. Mm -hmm. So as we like to say, it, it's more important uh, how we're doing this. Uh, it's less important what we actually do. The goals are only arbitrary because they can always be bigger. You can add six more zeros and it still won't be enough. You know, we're not gonna stop. So it's what uh, it makes of us as a worldwide community to achieve them together. And we saw that today across the world, uh, you saw it closer than anyone. You were working, uh, you know, broadcasting this and, and observing all, all of the devotees hand in hand, working towards what we could consider globally an unassailable type of service. It's mm -hmm. arguably one of the most important services uh, that Srila Prabhupada put before us and in and, and our line of teachers as well. Amazing. Um, I don't think we have any words to, to even say how grateful we are for your constant inspiration, not only in North America, but all over the world. And we saw that from many of the messages of thanks and gratitude towards yourself and the whole entire team behind this Live to Give campaign. Um, and we would just like to thank yourself and all the devotees all across the world that have been helping out with this Live to Give campaign. I would like to do the same. I'm... Uh... I'm in awe of the talent that's come together for all of this. Um, the vision for the future is, is extremely broad. There is a way in which as a movement, we, we create vision. Uh, uh, let me specifically talk about the book distribution movement and that item number seven, the set, there are seven main purposes that our founder and Acharya penned himself and the seventh was to print and publish and distribute books to achieve the aforementioned six and in doing this uh, he saw it as uh, important that uh, we really give everyone in the world a chance to take books so so far uh, we've uh, we've scratched the surface we have 10 times 100 times more potential to expand so what I see is a growing global movement of cooperation towards book distribution, emphasizing teamwork over individual accomplishments and looking towards supply chain management so that we can get more books out faster to more people around the world and also to uh, collaborate and 
use all best practices as quickly as possible, use all best strategies and all the most talented people in the world working together as one team. Uh, you two are examples of that. I mean, when we start, look, I'll just put it this way. It doesn't make any difference if you, if you, get, if you win a lot of money if you don't know what to do with it. <laughs> it really doesn't, it crushes people. So book, our book distribution movement and our forward looking um, vision, well, looking forward to ever increasing uh, numbers of books distributed gives us a, a way to engage all the talent in the world. Mm -hmm. It's one of the ways in which we could actually bring in all the talented young people, uh, middle aged and elderly people around the world to work together. So if elected, as Paul Jason say, I guarantee jobs, jobs, jobs. And Chaitanya Mahaprabhu said, if you spread this Sankirtan movement with abandon, you'll get jobs, jobs, jobs. <laughs> so my heartfelt thanks to both of you, to all that hosted here today, everyone who gave uh, so much to uh, coordinating this broadcast and to everybody out there who's giving towards the Live to Give campaign. We're going to do this um, in a cooperative way, in a collaborative way all over the world in uh, future campaigns coming up, probably starting the day after we finish this. Just as a <laughs> reminder, this marathon finishes uh, on January 7th. There's still time to, uh, to really shine during this uh, marathon and do something, everything counts. As we like to say, uh, not less than one and a little more than zero, please. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. <laughs> Hare Krishna. Thank you so very, very much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. you. You both were brilliant. Brilliant. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you for a vision that we can all get behind. I'm just thinking about this book di distribution as a way to engage everyone. Each, everyone can do it in their own way. Everyone can engage everyone. I love that. How, that's how we build this community and build our, our own local communities. So thank you. Thank you. So again, we'd just like to wrap, really quickly thank everybody all across the world. Um, Again, Vaishnav Gupta talked about using everybody's talents, and we certainly saw everybody's talents all across the world today, um, across nine countries, starting all the way from Australia and heading over several time zones and landing back here in North America. So we're very thankful to all of the organizers for individual countries, as well as the amazing um, team headed by Vaishnav Gupta and the wonderful broadcast team that's been part of here. Um, we just want to, again, plug in one last time um, that we have this Live to Give campaign, as Vaishnish Kupabu said, it's not over today, it's not over on the 31st, it's over only on January 7th. And even then, if you want to squeeze in at the last minute, we'll allow you. Um, so please, if you'd like to be part of the Live to Give campaign, whether it's getting a copy for yourself, sharing it with others, or donating towards the cause, there are pinned links all across all of our social media right now. Um, you can click on that. And as I mentioned, social media, please, please do check out our social media on World Gita Day, uh, both on Facebook on Insta and Instagram, and as well as our YouTube. So please like, share, whatever you can do um, to get the word out as best as possible. Another plug for Hare Krishna TV, where this is being broadcast on YouTube as well. Thank you so much. So much great content is there. Very, very, thank you very much. Thank you to Ramananda Saka. Uh, very, very special thanks for all that you have done and, and helping to bring this all together. Thank you so much again for the whole broadcast team, for all of you who've been helping all of us who have been a part of this. Um, and we will see you all next year in some way, shape or form with more goals, higher goals, at least double goals, each one of us or more than that. <laughs> oh, Brother Rani, I also... Finally, uh, I'd, like, I'd like to give a very special thanks to Shamohini and Anakul Seva. Uh, they have worked relentlessly at, uh, on the marketing uh, campaigns. Without them, I would be nowhere. I thank them from the bottom of my heart. They always work behind the scenes, uh, never put themselves forward, but I'm, I'm heartfelt thanks uh, to both of of you, Shamohini and Anakul Seva, for all that you're doing. There's many more to thank, but they're uh, they're my my hands, my eyes, everything, and I thank them very much. 
Wonderful. Thank you so much, everybody. And we wish everyone a very happy World Gita Day, Gita Jayanti, and Chris uh, Merry Christmas as well. And we will see you all next year. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Rama. Hare Rama. Rama Rama. Hare Hare.
Krishna, Krishna, Hare Krishna. 